Wat als ik wie een rode wie, kan je me naar de Utrecht in de divisie van de business, de drilling, de business, de normen, de prachtige leed wieten. Als je gaat me voelen, maar soms per de sapreet, als je me zegt, ik heb een paar COVID vond, dat ik heb een paar wies dat ik voor toe was, maar dat is mij. Als je me moest het gast van Jan, de divisie van de Utrecht. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Pristina. It's my second time. This time you even have an airport. And uh, uh, a lot has changed, but uh, we still have fantastic weather. This is my first summer day this year. Um, in the Netherlands it's just raining. I want to talk to you a bit about uh, MVDV and uh, some of our projects. Um, especially in the context of context. <laughs> we. Um, work actually a lot uh, in uh, this uh, contextualism or identity, if you want to say. And we are these kind of architects who always start with the globe. We, were, uh, we founded uh, the office in 1992, but uh, if you were asking for our philosophy, we go way back further. We are really much uh, influenced by this uh, report of the Club of Rome that says how the resources on the earth are going to uh, end at a certain moment and that we cannot grow anymore. And uh, that if we all would live like Americans, then we need to grow a few times. Um, so that was one thing that, uh, uh, that uh, lived throughout our youth. And the other thing is that we come from the Netherlands, which is uh, basically a very positive country. Even though uh, global warming might wipe it out one day, we actually have the idea that we can build anything like these futuristic things from the 1960s predicting that there would be um, flying cars in a few years and uh, all these things. So a positive outlook on the future based on technology and it's proven because 40% uh, of the national surface of the Netherlands is actually built by us. So it's not, it's not just an idea, it's also a practice. So I, our idea was always that we um, somehow don't have to consume less, but we have to just consume better because it's a, a negative message is always a bit uh, um, uh, difficult to sell to people, like uh, Al Gore did. Um, sprawl is one of the big issues of uh, um, contributing to the global uh, pro problematic, and as you can see in the Netherlands, we do have a lot of that. We're not much better. Uh, even our office has tried to, uh, uh, to work in sprawl and make it a little bit more bearable. And, but uh, deep down inside we are this office that is really uh, all about uh, densification. We think that densification is one of the essential things uh, um, that would help us on the globe. And uh, maybe not this kind of densification that you see in Hong Kong, which uh, leads to these perverted uh, apartments where people are not happy. But what we actually try and what our, our dream and our vision is that we make densification nicer. Imagine the earth is running out of uh, space why don't we just build a new floor on it? And we did that here in Hannover at the World Expo 2000 where we added uh, um, this Dutch pavilion with the dune landscape and flower fields on the second floor and the forest on the fifth floor and on the roof there was a dike and uh, a lake. And here you see the forest on the fifth floor, it actually still grows. So we can uh, create this uh, uh, nature. We also can create perhaps a suburban uh, uh, lifestyle but then stack it on top of each other. Like this building in Amsterdam you see here, it's uh, in planning and it will be built and uh, it will offer all that uh, what suburbia uh, offers, like, uh, but in a really central location. But you still will be able to uh, pluck your own apples in the 10th floor. This is uh, uh, hopefully, uh, in a way, um, helping these uh, Chinese people who are living in this kind of condition and uh, maybe it's a bit too expensive. So we're working to, to make it nice. It's easy to make a vertical village like in, for, for a few rich people, but how do you do that if you have more people? Like this. Um, then it becomes really difficult to build it. So is there a way to perhaps uh, build this uh, in a more efficient way that even uh, in China and India the masses can build their own homes and then stack them on top of each other? We've tried this many times, like uh, uh, this building in Amsterdam has at least uh, 15 different apartment types and some of them are uh, hanging from the ceiling. Also this building in Madrid looks much uh, less complex than it actually is. Inside you see a Tetris of all kinds of different apartments. 
And different apartments make sure that you have different people. In this building in Amsterdam, for example, you have social housing combined with really upmarket rent. And it just goes door to door and uh, it works together. And we are also trying to do this in, in India where you have uh, this flat uh, which contains 3,500 apartments once, it, once it's done. And the smallest ones will be 35 uh, square meters and the biggest ones 550. So totally different lifestyles in one building. Well, we try to do that all the time, but this is still mass manufactured housing, uh, even though there is a certain individuality. Uh, it could be all better. So here you see the orange tribune that we built for our research center at Delft University. It's, uh, we call it the Y factory, and we uh, think about the, uh, the future of the city. Um, we have scenarios and we have dreams. We can do whatever we want there, this is it, uh, during the opening. And uh, then we, uh, we publish these things. I brought a few books, so you can find them soon in your, in your library here. And there we, uh, we researched this uh, eco-city. So how, how, can, how egoistic can we be and how individualistic if we still stack ourselves? Uh, we uh, got in uh, 17 architects and 17 clients. Um, the clients were, of course, uh, fictional. Marilyn Manson is one of them, as you can see. And uh, um, the architects uh, thought about what kind of uh, build, um, homes do they want. And this led to this kind of uh, um, collection of different uh, lifestyles that we then put into a software, and the software put it together into one build building. And this building, in the end, looks like this. Now, perhaps in the future, this could be a way to uh, to offer people more than just mass manufactured homes in uh, in places like China. So maybe we can we can make it cheaper to build something like your own dream, like a um, suburban lifestyle, but then we stack it on top of each other. And what if we even would go uh, one step further? We also dream about that. What if we stop using concrete and wood and glass and we just use nanotechnology like these tiny particles and that these tiny particles are all around us and they, affect, they shape our, our homes and then uh, they, they respond to the way that we uh, move. So if you sleep your house is tiny and if you're awake your house is big and then uh, it's an entire city of these uh, uh, shapes all these people living in, in bubbles next to each other. When we all work, there will be only offices, and when we all uh, have fun, there will be only uh, leisure and retail. At the moment that we all um, uh, sleep, then there, there are only uh, small cubicles. Um, this might be a bit dystopian, but I want to remind you that architecture is an applied art, and that we actually um, do build for people. So you will see lots of people in our architecture pictures because we think that uh, without uh, showing that the architecture is inhabited, it doesn't really make sense. So you, you only do it for, for the use, like for people like Sylvia here, or Nicole, who lives in Marktal, or Ina, and uh, even James Bond uh, lives in one of our homes, and uh, they're all over Europe. Uh, Europe is this really busy uh, space, as you can see. Uh, there's a lot of activity, it's all very light. And uh, we are extremely busy and we do this uh, business in a very specific way. We like it uh, to be really small. There are not so many monster um, in megalopolises in, uh, in Europe. We have all these tiny cities and we are quite happy in them. And they're beautiful. You see here the, uh, the world map of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites and uh, it's basically a European thing. It's, uh, it's all over Europe. So this is the typical European uh, town. It has the castle, the beauty, and uh, it's like a big dream for every mayor. Wouldn't you want to be mayor of this? And in the, uh, the European city, people walk, people have metros, there are tram lines everywhere, and they're still being built everywhere, and we cycle. And you see that the cyclists move, the cars don't. But we also made lots of mistakes in Europe, like uh, everywhere else. Also, this is Europe, this is like the ugly side, and I wonder whether you could even uh, um, tell me what city this is, and can you tell me what city this is? So suddenly we, we lose a lot uh, in, in what we do. And uh, you can also see that in the real estate prices. In the blue area, which is the historical uh, city center of Amsterdam, is really expensive, whereas the red uh, area is uh, post-war uh, mass manufactured housing, and it, it's not expensive, it's really cheap, and it's unwanted. 
people are trying to get into these uh, green and blue areas. And not just in Europe, we actually export this model. You see a typical American city with a downtown and a typical American suburb without any life, uh, with lots of cul-de-sacs where the life actually ends. Uh, you can go up to here and then it's, it's over. And, but we also see this in America. Suddenly you see this uh, Spanish town or here in Los Angeles you see a piece of Italy. So it's an export model. Here you have uh, the, the Asian uh, metropolis, uh, towers and uh, infrastructure. And then suddenly we see this uh, piece of Amsterdam in Turkey or a piece of uh, Copenhagen in, uh, in China. Also here an English town in Shanghai. So we, we, we try to uh, somehow sell Europe to the world. You can buy it, it's cute, it's beautiful. And it's a real, um, um, you say, people want this uh, somehow. They want the cuteness and they want this uh, small scale. So how does a, a super Dutch office work with that? We are kind of famous for being this uh, uh, hyper-modern uh, uh, office, which was uh, once in this book in 2000, uh, as one of these generation of super Dutch architects, we became really famous with this, our very first uh, building ever, a uh, television center for a public broadcaster in the Netherlands. And um, uh, quite recently there was another book that uh, didn't say that Dutch architecture is all about uh, hypermodernism, but it's also about uh, uh, postmodernism, so that the Dutch architecture actually has two faces. Uh, it has this very traditional uh, postmodernist uh, face, and on the, on the other hand, it has this uh, this MD, MVRDV face. And in the book, uh, we are under the uh, chapter "Fuck the Context," which is actually a quote from Rem Kohlhaas, not from us, but uh, somehow our building ended up there. And when we saw this, we couldn't resist to uh, actually uh, draw into the book and show where the context is. There's a lot of context. The building is actually responding to all kinds of things in its surrounding. Just because it's modern, it doesn't mean it's not uh, contextual. You see it here disappear in its uh, surrounding. The parking spot is even worse than the building. And uh, this is how, um, how it actually uh, reacts to the garden and how there is a garden on top. This is, uh, strangely enough, uh, considered more contextual. Huh? All these towers in front of the historical town, this is The Hague. And uh, this actually ended up in the, um, in the chapter of the contextual architecture. And also this, like a new, uh, newly constructed uh, canal in the Netherlands. You see it's, uh, there, there are no people in this picture. And if you Google 1930s architecture in the Netherlands, then you, you end up with this, uh, this image search. And you can see that most of these buildings are actually new. They're not 1930s built, but they're 1930s style. So suddenly we are really copying the past again. The problem is that we don't really copy it properly because this is a 1930s or maybe even a bit older house uh, interior and you see it's really beautiful with wood, with high ceilings and all these things, but in modern 1930s homes they, they look like this. They're just uh, modern houses, uh, really boring ones and they have a really uh, kind of uh, nice outside. So it's all a facade, it's like, like a Potemkin history. Sometimes uh, people in the Netherlands say, yeah, this is because of all these uh, these nasty parties, people uh, crisis, people want to move back to the past and they feel safe and secure in the past. But it's not just uh, these parties, also our migrant uh, community in, in, in Rotterdam, actually more than half the population, they also like this beautiful old architecture. For them this is beautiful, so they built this uh, mosque, this, which looks a bit like it comes out of a fairy tale. And then uh, they built themselves this, um, um, yeah, this Moroccan style caspar. Uh, which uh, actually became uh, very um, you know, popular not just with uh, uh, Moroccans but also with uh, Dutch people and it uh, was a real, uh, really good project because it started to um, uh, mix uh, different population groups. We, uh, this is one of ours again, you see the difference, it's a bit more modern. It's in China, it's uh, an experiment where we mix uh, high rise with uh, low rise uh, in between these uh, tall fl uh, flats, you see typical Dutch homes in a way. It's brick and it's low, but we said it's uh, for us. This is like a modern version of the traditional hotel in China, and we gave all these houses a little uh, gateway because the Chinese uh, 
like to use these gateways uh, for the Bouton. And this was uh, during construction. And then after construction we came back a few years later, had a look, so you see that uh, there is much more plant uh, growth now. And also somebody actually made uh, turned this uh, port into a real port. So then this was a good moment. We thought this is really working. It is a new Bouton and this family actually made this uh, traditional port to show how important they are. So this is what we like. This is the, uh, the tradition and uh, the modern architecture. I'll show you how we have to sometimes fight here. Uh, we we um, won this competition for a building called the Culture Cluster. Doesn't sound really uh, poetic. It's in a place called Sandan. Sandan is one of these many European uh, world heritage sites. It's very famous because Tsar Peter the Great actually won, um, and I learned how to uh, make ships there. But if, uh, if tourists come to Zandam, and they often come with the, with the train, then they end up in this kind of surrounding. So it has absolutely no correct character, and it could be anywhere in the Netherlands, and maybe even in other places than the Netherlands. And the city council was kind of sad. They said, oh, this is not going to work. So they asked uh, this uh, architect called Schultz Lucas to uh, to bring back identity and uh, uh, and and, and a, play, uh, yeah, a place really, and so he built them uh, this uh, Disney version of the uh, World uh, Heritage Site, which is all these little uh, fishing houses, but then really big. Here you see the city hall, and right next to it you see uh, they built uh, this hotel. Very nice. Um, in a way, it's again. Uh, there's a lot of outside, but inside it's a really uh, normal building. It's something like an Ibis hotel, so not really uh, super from, from, from the inside. But you see, they did a lot of that, and uh, so then there was this competition for this uh, culture building. And what could we do? So you have the traditional Zan's house, then you have the Zan city hall, then you have the Zan hotel. So what, what would we do? The Zan culture cluster. What else can we do? And sometimes, somehow, we have to work with this uh, with this idea because otherwise, of course, we wouldn't win the competition. How to how to do this? Now, the, the task was this: you had to uh, put these eight uh, cultural uh, centers all together in one big uh, structure. And we thought, how? Uh, what would uh, connect them all? So, this was our concept diagram. Right? We just put them all together in one big uh, volume, and then in the middle you have maybe some kind of. Uh, communal space or that they can all use together. Um, what about if we use this uh, house as the communal space? But yeah, we, we had this already and uh, it's not going to fit like this, um, so it needs to be a bigger building. So what if we just uh, use the, the volume of this house uh, as the atrium? And we use it for all the functions to connect and also uh, for the restaurant. And then we put the rest of the program around it. And now suddenly we have this inverted version of the of this program that they use so successfully already. So here you have the volume, 7,500 uh, square meters. We put uh, for each of the cultural centers one uh, void in, and then suddenly a really complex building starts to appear. It is a, a mix of individuality and also a community sense. And this is how it's going to look like. We won the competition, and uh, it's now. Uh, Planning. Uh, from the interior, there will be uh, the exterior facade of the wooden house, and the uh, exterior of the cultural center will be the interior. So we basically just mix them. Uh, we make them. Uh, you know, we basically invert this uh, Fisher house. So on the outside, you will see uh, cookbooks, clocks, and paintings, and in the inside will be cladded with wood. And this is how it's going to look like inside. And then you see this uh, really complex building up here. And so, uh, yeah, we're now in the, in the phase of the planning and the city has approved it because also in the Netherlands the democratic process means that uh, people actually have a say and uh, they, uh, they have a meaning, a very loud meaning and, uh, oh, well, there's a good uh, discussion right now. How would we do this for, um, if we go a step further, this is the, the ultimate uh, American and Asian um, typology, the skyscraper. Can you make this... Uh, also create one in the same way. It's a skyscraper is pretty stupid and all you can do is you enter it and then you can go up and down and that's basically it. 
there's not much more to it. So we built one in Lego, it wasn't really difficult. So uh, and then we thought, well, how can we change this a little bit? So basically, if you just change one Lego block, already you have so much more quality. Suddenly you have halfway through an address, and uh, you have an outside space where you can, uh, can sit, and you have also an, uh, um, an office space perhaps, or a house that has a, a view on three sides. That's really nice. So if we put this kind of uh, tower then in BIM, and we start to mess a little bit with the um, uh, conditions, and we make it look really uh, you know, complex, then we end up with these kind of towers. And suddenly we end up with a tower that has the same kind of uh, quality like an Italian uh, mountain village. Uh, so you can you have an outside life, you have trees outside, piazzas, and you can see your neighbors and you can shout at them that you want to borrow some tomatoes or so. Whereas in a normal tower, everybody looks to the outside, you can't see your neighbors. Maybe some people like it, but uh, most people like this, uh, this more social lifestyle. So here you have it all together. And then we started, to, we got to two million Lego stones from Lego, and uh, we started to really build them. And uh, this is the, the, the tallest height we were allowed to do by the university, because the university was a bit scared we would lose some students when the towers would turn uh, topple. And they thought it was too dangerous, so then we made them a bit smaller, uh, put lots of them in the computer, and then built them all in Lego. And so, in the future, if Christina needs some uh, towers, you can just give us a call, we'll send you one of them. <laughs> and we also built one. Um, tower is a big word in Oslo, because Norway is not really into uh, uh, tall towers, but uh, this one with 17 floors was already like a really big step for the city. So we, we start with this uh, volume, we remain some sidelines, we make a passageway through an arcade to the entrance, we dip it down to the south, and then we make an exterior route all the way from, uh, from the root of ground floor to the roof. We spread all the special program all over the structure so that you have all these addresses. Then we connect them with two interior walkways, one up, one down. We glaze this uh, walkway so that you can see it from the outside. And this is basically what happens. So you can walk in this office building all the way up and all the way down. It's for a Norwegian bank that uh, was uh, spread out of, uh, I think, 17 locations all over Oslo and they had to now suddenly come into this big new uh, uh, building and they were a bit scared that um, they would lose touch with each other. And so now they have this uh, communal space where they can all go to. And what's also really funny is that this building now has only unique plans. There's not one plan and still we managed to, to build it in this uh, um, in a way, really efficiently, because we worked with this pixel, and uh, the pixel is always the same, steel frame, so the costs weren't uh, too bad. The bank asked us for really boring, generic office space, because they wanted to work in peace. But the thing is, in this office space, if you work there and you walk away from your desk, your desk is no longer yours, because they don't have their own desks. If you want to have a coffee, for example, you need to leave this area of the bank, you need to go into the communal space, and there's your kitchen, and then you, you see all the, uh, the colleagues. And you also see the stair there, this is the, actually the, the walkway from the ground floor to the roof. So, and here you see, uh, every time you walk uh, out there and you take a coffee or water, you have to uh, meet all these other people. So in, in this way, people still see each other. And that is in a bank with all these different uh, security zones where people are uh, not allowed to even enter their, uh, their work area. Areas, and so this is how it works. And you, you can walk in, in this walkway. It's all Scandinavian with a lot of wood, and you can see your colleagues work in, in the other rooms. And again, here you have this. Uh, well, I wouldn't call this an Italian village, but the, the principle is the same. Right? You see activities. Uh, you can see outside the window, and you see people uh, walking up and down. And they actually do. These Norwegians, they're real diehards. After lunch, which is in the basement or on the on the top floor they actually walk all the way to, them, uh, to their workspaces because they're kind of sportive and uh, they just do it. And this is the communal space, uh, a public passage uh, going right through the building. Can you imagine a bank in Kosovo deciding to just open up its building and let the, the people walk right through? In many countries that's not possible, but in Norway uh, that was one of the, the qualities. And so we realized that. And maybe this is the next step in Jakarta. Uh, 400 meters where we try to stack an entire um, neighborhood on top of each other. 
Now on the city level, can we also create this intimate uh, space? Can we create an intimate city uh, when we start all over again? We were invited by Bordeaux to come up with the city of the future for them. And they have already built the city of the future in the 1970s. This is what it looks like, really exciting architecture. Um, but the public space doesn't really work. Uh, they try to separate cars and people and the result is that you don't have uh, people at all because on these decks where the people are supposed to walk it's too dangerous and uh, so in Bordeaux they really consider it a failure. They don't consider this a failure which is their old city, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site again and uh, when they came to us they said what we want to do is uh, uh, on the other side of the river where you have a lot of industries for us, can you please create a new part of town with 3,500 uh, homes that has the same quality like the, like the old town, but maybe even better quality, so more light and more air, but uh, the, same, the same kind of uh, love for the area. So this is our site. And then we were on a, in, I think that was a really difficult kind of uh, uh, um, question because here you see for example Dorchester, other people have tried it, this is, this is the, the English town of Dorchester and just outside of Dorchester Prince Charles has built a, a copy of Dorchester and it looks like this. And uh, in Belgium when uh, university started to uh, have a divorce, uh, the Flemish part is left behind with this old town called Leuven and uh, the other university built for themselves a new town which is called Louvain la Neuve. And also here, it, uh, it doesn't look the same. So just by making a copy, it wouldn't work. So what we thought is we have to uh, more or less copy the structure of the medieval city. So if you, if you start to play for God, maybe then you should go and talk to the people. So here you see uh, how we started the project with the bicycle and with meeting the, the people that live all around and uh, uh, listen to what they have to say. You cross over the river and then you, are, you end up in this place. And this is our site. It's a lot of derelict uh, industry and uh, right next to a working class neighborhood that was looking at this new project really um, critically because Bordeaux had already started and failed. They had built this uh, environment in the neighborhood, uh, basically yuppie homes with uh, a big fence around them. No life whatsoever. These people would leave in the morning, come back in the evening to sleep there and they wouldn't add anything to this, uh, to this neighborhood. So this is not what they wanted anymore and uh, everybody was now looking for us to see that we would do that better. Oh, sorry, I'm going back. And uh, besides that, they uh, have a lot of projects. So in pink you see all these uh, big future projects and as you can see ours is only a small part of it but a really essential one because very close to the uh, old city. So what we, we started with these logos. Let's uh, make urbanism a bit easier to understand. So we have the left uh, and the right side of the river, and then we want to make them the same. Then we want to make them really dense. We want to have some uh, heritage on both sides, because uh, that's really good. We want to have it mixed, and we want to have an intimate city, and that's, that's really essential here for the success. We want to have a green city, and we, have, we want to have a zero energy city. Now, zero energy is really uh, expensive and Bordeaux is a rich city so they can afford it. And uh, it needs to be connected. I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> we wanted to have daylight and uh, yeah, connections. Well, here you see the site. So basically we have two um, uh, former uh, railway stations and in between them a Napoleonic uh, um, army barrack. And the first thing is what we said, is we, we keep everything. It's all holy. Nothing is going to be demolished. We're not going to uh, remove anything from this side. We're going to leave everything. Every rotten piece of wall will be, uh, will be kept. Because this is the heritage. And uh, heritage, in this case, uh, we, we thought was our only uh, starting point. We see, uh, so this is how we, how we keep the structure, the rest of the empty spots we fill in and then uh, we end up with this space around it. So this is space that uh, pedestrians and uh, cars have to share and uh, we, we showed the city of Bordeaux this image of uh, Rome where it works. 
Uh, you, you can have these uh, shared spaces where cars and pedestrians and bicycles and uh, it's all going uh, uh, to mix and it works. And then on top of that we have some more um, uh, uh, pedestrianized areas that work a bit more like this, where the cars are not welcome. And then we start with the urban planning, so we go up, walk 100 meters with the structures uh, as a starting point, and then uh, we uh, cut them down in a 45 degree angle to uh, get some daylight, and then this one appears. And then we said, okay, in winter we want to have every uh, ground floor level to have at least two hours of sun. Uh, that's better than the, the old city. And then uh, we end up with this. And you already see that there is a landscape uh, starting to emerge. We contextualize it a little bit. We make uh, small streets, only six meters wide. Uh, the widest street, uh, streets here are 10 meters. So it's really not, uh, um, we don't have these canyons for cars or tramways. It's all very small. We add all these uh, pocket gardens. Uh, these are all parks that are going to be uh, maintained by the people who live in the area. Um, so easy for the city and very good for the community spirit. And then instead of one architecture office who builds it all, we will invite 144 architecture offices. And it, can, it could be anything, it doesn't matter, because the, the urban plan is pretty strict. So uh, you, can, uh, you can be a traditionalist or a block maker, it doesn't matter. They're all welcome. We add uh, natural ventilation, then some uh, um, solar panels, green roofs, uh, grey water circuit, and this is how it then looks. So what we are going to do is we're going to um, transform this kind of uh, um, structure along all these uh, steps slowly into this weird landscape and then this in the end uh, emerges. And that is a city that, uh, that we don't really know and we still know because it's, it's based on the, uh, on the existing but then it has these weird roofscapes. And so it's going to be really nice. Here you see the old barracks and this is how they're going to be looking like later on. Yeah, and then we had to sell it to the mayor and the mayor said, well, that's all very nice but what about my UNESCO World Heritage status? If you do all that, will it be um, Endangered, and so we went to UNESCO with two plans. One plan was with only low uh, housing, so you wouldn't see it from the other side of the river, and then one with our uh, parametric uh, spikes and spires. And in the end, uh, they uh, they went for the for the more daring one. And then, so it will be there will be a few towers, and you will see them from the UNESCO protected uh, part of town. We then made this art project to sell the um, uh, the project to the to the people, and you see, uh, so that you could actually uh, walk the streets of the new area all by yourself, just by walking through these weird shapes. And uh, yeah, this is how we're going to do it. The first uh, few projects are now under construction, and the next 10 years they're going to, to uh, build uh, this intimate city. And then perhaps in, uh, in 20 years' time, we can be uh, we come back here and we uh, we discuss whether it worked or not whether it is just the next kind of bad example Pompeii and Van der Neuve and Bastille Niel or will it be actually a good example and will it have worked we pretty we're pretty sure that this is going to work because there's a lot of mix in this uh, in this neighborhood I want to talk to you um, about another kind of context it's the uh, birth village of Vinny Maas. He uh, um, comes from this tiny village of Schreindl, nobody knows it, it's in Brabant. It's a, it's a very densely populated uh, agrarian uh, area in the south of the Netherlands. And they have lost the city center in the war. And maybe because of that they love these uh, nostalgic houses. So as you can see they built all these, this is all new. So there's a lot of love for, uh, for the past. Really a lot actually. You see it everywhere, and these people even bought themselves um, an English cottage, which is not really normal for the Netherlands, but okay. This is how Schreindl looked before the, the war, and uh, then after the war it looked like that. And uh, the war basically left this big space in the city and in, in the town center, and nobody dared to touch it. It was really uh, empty and uh, lots of parking spots, way too big for this uh, for this tiny town, with twenty thousand. Uh, inhabitants. So when Vinnie was 18, he uh, sent this letter to the mayor saying, please do something, you need to have an idea contest. And then the mayor said, um, thank you, uh, not now, but maybe we'll come back to you later. 
and uh, actually the mayor called back, but it was 30 years later. So here you see the situation before the war, after the war, and then we were invited and the mayor said to Vini, so uh, can you do something for me here that makes my, my town really famous and that the entire country will know us? Yeah, okay, we can do that. Why don't you build a 300 meter tall tower <laughs> and uh, you're going to be famous. Oh, God. So it took us seven uh, projects and uh, um, two city councillors to actually come up with the idea that the entire city council would, uh, um, would determine a, a maximal volume. And this, this is the maximal volume. And funny enough, it looks like a, a, a farm, which for us was a problem because it could never be a farm. They wanted to have shops in there. So, um, but we had an idea, so we, we looked at all the farms that were left, there were like uh, uh, 84 of these farms left, we put them all into SketchUp, we copied their facades, and then we slowly determined the average facade of all these farms. And we did that with the sites as well, and this is then basically uh, the result of 84 farms in an average uh, um, calculation. This is the average Schreindl farm. And then we put it on the side, and uh, of course it was too small. But hey, that's uh, no problem, we just make it bigger, plop, 1.6 times bigger. And this is how we, we wanted to build it. But then the city said, well, you can only use traditional farm materials, like thatch, and uh, brick, and wood, and then maybe glass. Glass, okay, let's use glass. And so we found a way to use glass and make this a full glass building, but we printed. Uh, this old farm that we photographed onto the, uh, onto the glass and this is basically uh, what then happened. So here you see all the different layers, the brick, the, uh, the facade elements, a creative layer added by an artist uh, and windows. And so we basically had to, had to open the glass from time to time that it's actually transparent and it can, you can see that here. Um, and it became a, kind of a, a hit. It's a monument to local history. Uh, it's, it's all their own things. So what you see here is, is a Photoshop of this, uh, uh, of all these 84 uh, farms, because the photographer went there, photographed them, put them together before, and then we printed it onto this glass. And now all these uh, 84 farms have a place in the center of, uh, of Schreindl. Uh, it's 1,008 uh, panels. And if one of them breaks, you can see here there's a little number, and they can just reprint it easily. And from the inside it looks like this, you look at the, uh, you see the farm from the inside, if you wash your hands you see the farm, and this is how uh, Schreindl slowly uh, merges into the, into the brick of the farm, where if you, if you look through a window, you have these really weird uh, kind of uh, aesthetics, uh, like the shop window with the farm window, and the ice salon, the yoga center. And uh, as much as bad interior architects try to ruin it, um, they don't really succeed because the, the design is so strong that it's kind of overpowering and it's, it stays, the concept stays uh, pretty much alive. Yes, and then the mayor was happy because BBC came to Schreindl for the first time in its history. In Rotterdam we're doing another uh, project uh, uh, with a very different uh, and very difficult context which is an art depot for Boymans from Berningen. Boymans from Berningen is a museum which has a collection worth 7 billion uh, Euro, but they can only show uh, uh, two to five percent of that in the museum. Of course, the highlights like this one are shown, and uh, the rest is in the basement. And the basement, whenever in summer it rains, and there is a lot of rain in summer, then it just floods. Here you see the director of the museum uh, in the basement, and I can tell you that this is really bad for for paintings and for for art in general when it gets wet. So. Um, the city gave money so that they could uh, move the art into a depot outside the city. But the director had other ideas and he found a sponsor and the sponsor gave money to build a public art depot in the city center. Because this collection was property of the people of Rotterdam and the people of Rotterdam should be able to see it. And uh, it shouldn't be hidden away. So they said, okay, let's build it in the city center in this piece of park. The park was uh, designed by Ren Kohlhaas. So very uh, heavy opposition started instantly, but as you can see, this is the, this is the space. It wasn't used so much, uh, lots of pebbles, uh, parking garage entrance, not the most attractive part of the, of the city. Uh, but there was so much um, protest that uh, soon an urban plan was uh, 
uh, made to extend the park everywhere possible, so actually the park will be no bigger. And uh, these are the neighbors. We have to work here on this side somehow, and there was of course a competition. And uh, the first idea was to, um, to do this. It looks a bit like an IKEA table, and uh, so we thought we, we put it on stilts. You have a sculpture garden on the roof, and inside you have all the art totally uh, secure. Uh, Netherlands are pretty low, uh, below sea level, uh, especially this part, and if it ever floods, then at least the art is uh, safe. But uh, the budget kicked in, and we calculated that we couldn't even pay the, the iron that would, uh, would be needed, or the steel, to build this thing. So we had to figure out something else, and we started with the cheapest possible volume, and even that was too expensive, so that was a problem. What to do? How can you have even less facade than this? Because the facade was the really expensive thing uh, for this art depot. So maybe make it, uh, oops, sorry, make it round. So that worked, and we just managed with the budget. Then we made it a bit smaller to destroy less of the park, a bit bigger on the roof. So you have a nice view. And you can look all around it. Uh, the, this round shape really uh, offers uh, a lot of uh, benefits. And then we thought, well, why don't we clad it with something which is reflective so that you, uh, you hardly ever see the building. You can even look around the corner and uh, towards the top it's uh, invisible. And only at night you can see uh, the building a bit. So this is uh, during daytime and at night or in bad weather you see a glow from inside. So almost a stealth building on this very uh, disputed site. Um, currently the park is this, a lot of trees had to, uh, had to be relocated and uh, in Rotterdam they have a tree asylum so they take the tree away, they put it somewhere uh, to grow further and then when this building is done they will put all the trees on the park. This is the, the design. And so we won the competition and uh, we are in the last phase of planning and quite soon we are going to, uh, we're going to start uh, to build it. Inside is really complex. We have seven climate zones because uh, water is bad for art, but people that walk through is also really bad for art. So um, half the um, half the budget is actually for the installations. And here is the big space in the center. We have this big atrium, and it will look like this um, you know, canyon full of uh, art pieces. People can walk through, and sometimes we will light out some of them so that you get. You know, it's dirt in your uh, experience, and you can walk uh, freely, but uh, the really expensive stuff is behind bars, and you can only go there with, uh, with the guided tour. But this is happening all the time, so you will never have to wait a long time, and then there will be all these artist spaces and uh, uh, individual spaces. And here's the roof, and the roof will be accessible to everybody, so uh, no entrance fee, you can just uh, move all the way up. Well, Amsterdam, totally different context again, uh, very um, difficult, highly protected. Pese Hofstraat, which is a residential street, uh, at least it, once, it, was, it was a residential street once. Uh, after the war it became more and more of a commercial street and today it's actually the most uh, um, expensive street of the Netherlands. Um, all the big uh, uh, shops are there like Prada and Gucci, the footballers buy their stuff there, it's right next to all the museums, so lots of people from China come there to shop, and Amsterdam has this hope that this could be the Champs-Élysées of Amsterdam, and the big brands, they want their big shops there. Problem is that everything is kind of protected and guarded, and uh, that it's actually too small for these uh, shops. Uh, the owner of those two White Houses still got the permission somehow to demolish them, so once he got the permission he instantly did it, that the, that the city couldn't uh, um, come up with a new idea. And this is how it looked, and uh, this is what he wanted to build, but he couldn't get it through the uh, planning. And then in the end they gave him planning uh, to build this thing. But he hated it, he said this is really bad, uh, this is destroying the, the character of this historical street, and I, I don't want to do that. It's, it's already bad in a way that I you know, um, demolished these, these beautiful old structures, but uh, this is just not working. And so he came to us uh, to ask for a plan B, and we just uh, went to the archives. We had a look at what was there before. It once looked like this, all these residential homes. And we said, why don't you just use the old um, 
uh, the old uh, design and you make it bigger. You just stretch it, okay? We've done that with Schrendel, remember? So, and then uh, you make it invisible almost because you need big shop windows. So uh, this is your site and you just put this in, those two buildings. And so that was our idea and he loved it and we, we tried to figure it out. And other than Schrendel, we wanted to go a step further and make it really authentic by building this uh, entire uh, historical structure in, in stone, but glass stone. Everything would be glass. And this is how it would look like. You see, beautiful, everything in glass. It never, was never done, but uh, everybody thought it would be absolutely fantastic. So we went to the city with this idea, and they said no. <laughs> brick needs to be brick. It can't be glass. Okay? So we looked at the permit they gave us, and we, we calculated the percentage of glass and the percentage of, um, of brick. Then we did it to another, uh, a few other buildings and we found out that it's on average 20%. So we said, okay, this is the, uh, the original uh, house, this is our idea, and now what we do is we're going to just uh, make it all brick and then we open it up again uh, according to the percentage that uh, the city allows and then we, we end up with this. So the glass facade is slowly pixeling out towards the top. Okay, this is how it works. And then the city said yes, and uh, then we had a problem, we had to build it. <laughs> <laughs> Never done, huh? so we went to Venice and we found a glass maker, an old family uh, company that could make us really precise glass bricks. So that was good, that was solved. And uh, here you see the production line. Uh, but the more difficult thing was how to connect these glass bricks. What we didn't want to do is this... Uh, you know, these 1970s uh, blocks with a lot of cement in it. We really wanted to have transparent cement. How to do it? So we went to uh, uh, the University of Delft, the material um, uh, department, and they started to look for the right kind of uh, uh, connector. And they found something in the dental technology. So you see it's applied here, and then it has to dry with this uh, UV light. And then it becomes really strong, and uh, it really works well in these stress tests. You see a stress test of the facade, we have to add some extra glass, and this is then how, uh, how it was done. Here you see all the window sills and the window frames arrived in Amsterdam, and uh, the arches, they were also uh, done. And then we, we started to construct on the side. As you see, the, the entire building was finished, except for this uh, glass facade. And then we had to uh, um, make this very tight because you have to uh, work without dust. It was the cleanest uh, construction site uh, ever. You can see the, the construction workers with gloves. For them that was totally new. Extremely slow. They needed between 10 minutes and 1 hour for each brick. First glue them and make them clean. And at the end they had to, uh, to use this UV light. So this is the real speed, just in case you wonder. <laughs> and the light. So they went home and said, well, today I made like uh, 20 bricks. <laughs> slowly started uh, to grow and then uh, this was the, actually the most expensive detail because uh, the, um, the connection between those two uh, materials didn't really work so it was a long research. At a certain moment it was unveiled and, uh, and then suddenly uh, yeah, this is how it looks. Uh, the first tenant is Chanel but they will, uh, they will move out again. Uh, Chanel didn't need that much space so sadly they, uh, they put a wall in front of the, the, the top floor a few flowers, so uh, you don't really see um, the full potential of this building yet. But uh, maybe, uh, maybe in the future. What's really nice is everybody who walks past by has to touch it, so they have to use a lot of uh, uh, cleaning uh, to, to clean this uh, facade. The people really, really want to touch it. They, they don't believe what they see. It's really surrealistic. And that's not the only thing we did in glass, huh? so uh, we're not done yet with glass, so we, we want to max it out, so we, we designed this kitchen in glass, 
And then we filled this uh, former factory in Hong Kong with uh, only glass. We said it's a beautiful structure, but uh, we're not going to add anything but glass. You see it here. This is the glass office. We just uh, uh, completed it in Hong Kong. And then what about the glass city? Uh, so you can always see the horizon. Here, glass cars and glass tram lines. This project is uh, maybe also interesting for Pristina because it deals with something that's gone. The Hutong in Beijing uh, is on that basis. This is the idea that it, uh, that it used to be. Uh, then this happened. It was basically demolished. And uh, uh, the one, the Hutongs that they still have is now really gentrified and in a way fake. It's a bit Disney. If you look inside, you see that often it's concrete now and it's not really the old structure anymore. So we came up with a plan to save the Hutong. We made a catalogue of many, many designs, uh, things that we liked, uh, put them all together in a master plan. So here you have the glass uh, hutong, you have the shopping hutong, you have the McDonald's hutong, you have the parking hutong, which uh, opens up uh, if you put your car in. And uh, we again try to, to tell the city that it can be done with, uh, with an art project. Uh, then they don't take you so serious, so if you make an art project, you invite the clients, then the next morning you sit with the clients on the table and you start to see whether you can test your ideas in one, one of the many locations. And this is the location they gave to us. Um, and it was a tough location because there was nothing left. So again we went to the archives and had a look what was there one, once in the, in the past and we found out that this was uh, demolished. So we recreated it, we put it on the uh, site and then the idea is basically that you um, that you make this in wood and then you just put pour concrete over this entire thing. And then you end up with this kind of thing. You create a building, perforate it a little bit, in the evening it, uh, it's very shiny. And then what you see is that a cast, an inverted cast of the Hutong. And uh, so you have an idea of what was once there, but it's a totally new thing. Good, I want to st stop at uh, Marktal. Last thing, that's probably way out of time already. Um, again, a very difficult context, uh, the city center of Rotterdam, medieval city center, we're right in the heart of it at the old market square, but uh, Rotterdam was bombed during the war and it was totally lost. You see here in red our site, and so not a lot was left. After the war the city center was rebuilt very cheaply because all the money had to be invested into the port and uh, uh, devastating, but uh, in a metropolitan area of 1.5 million inhabitants, the city center at a certain moment had only 20,000 people left. So how to deal with this? And right next to, to this uh, place where we wanted to build, there was this big square without any life. How to, can, can one building actually do something? The city thought yes, and they said what we need here is a covered market market that is open every day and because Rotterdam has so little inhabitants we also need housing so there needed to be a combination of housing market parking and perhaps even a school so the city said let's do it in 2004 they, in, uh, they organized a uh, competition for investors because they didn't want to invest anything themselves they wanted the market to solve it and that was the moment that we were uh, invited to come uh, and uh, think along one of the investors, uh, Provost from The Hague. We didn't know what a covered market was because there was none in the Netherlands. It was a totally new thing. And uh, so what we did, we went to Spain to have a look how the Spanish people do covered markets. And what we learned there is the good stuff, like this. Yeah? So you see that they know how to stage food. They make it look really nice. And uh, they have a food culture that we don't really have in the Netherlands. So this is something we wanted. So we wanted to make this, uh, this food look really great. What we didn't want was this situation. When uh, in the afternoon the market closes, then the entire neighborhood closes down. So this market needs to be open much longer than this uh, Spanish market. We also learned that uh, what we didn't really want is this kind of uh, situation where you have a claustrophobic uh, low ceiling, which is black. The, the Dutch people don't know a covered market, so um, we thought we needed a really tall space. 
We also learned in Spain that we need to have a supermarket on the ground floor so that uh, lots of people would come there anyway and then uh, uh, walk through the market. So, a bit drunk in Spain, we started the first sketch. So we have a Venetian palazzo on top with lots of housing and underneath this uh, uh, cave of a beautiful cathedral for food. That was the first concept. With this concept, very happy, our client went to The Hague and uh, showed it to his colleagues, especially the financial department was really interested about this design because uh, they saw that it couldn't be done, it was too expensive. In Rotterdam the situation is a bit dire, you can already uh, buy uh, homes for 800 euros a square meter and uh, the market was a special problem because uh, they wanted to have an authentic market where you can only ask for each stall uh, 45 euros a day. So how to do that? They made us a proposal. They said, this is what we can do. We can basically uh, have two uh, slabs with housing, one rental, one uh, property, and in between a tiny market hall. The slabs need to be built as efficient as possible because we need to make more profit to, to pay for the market because the market was basically a negative uh, equity on their uh, balance. And then we said, okay, yeah, we can make you a nice uh, facade for that, but you know, Rotterdam is kind of critical, they want good architecture quality. How do, you, um, how do you win the competition with this? And it took us a few weeks and a lot of talking, and then we, we just found a simple solution to just turn this thing around, because they could pay for that. Why not just then build it, but build it upside down? And so suddenly we have this big space in the center. We have a, yeah, a market hall. We use the, the, the apartments as wall and we use penthouse apartments as ceiling. Very simple. Then we bend it a little bit so that we have more light, but then the elevators don't fit in, so we put the elevators in again, and then uh, they can make more money on the ground floor with, uh, with the retail. So we make the ground floor a bit bigger, and this is basically how this, uh, this structure came. And then we have to build it in a very efficient way, and so it's not actually an arch, it's two buildings with one layer of bridge in between them. And uh, so it was built. So what you see here is Marktal Rotterdam, and it's a totally rational building. It's not a folly by a crazy architect, no, it's basically what the market made possible in this city. It's a very contextual building as such, in many ways. I'm going to walk through this with uh, you for a moment. So you have on the, um, on the ground floor, on the first floor, you have the market and retail, restaurants, everything is about food. You cannot buy t-shirts in the market hall. So 100 market stands in the center of the hall. We designed them uh, together with an interior architect as neutral as possible because it was really important that all the market stalls could uh, uh, create their own identity. So tapas from Basque country, frozen yogurt from America, and this Dutch uh, cheese farmer who was actually uh, selling the cheese from his uncle. And uh, so they all have their own thing and they sell most, of course, this is French fries. And uh, um, what was also really important was that Marktal was not a chic building. So there was a, a, a real balance in who was actually um, inside. So you have uh, really posh places where they sell chicken for 27 euro. And it's probably this French uh, chicken that had its own shrink uh, to prepare it for the death. But you also have this really bad uh, uh, chicken for three euro. And everything in between. Everybody's welcome. On the top of, uh, of these uh, market stalls, we have either glass, some urban farming, or restaurant terraces. And uh, this is how it works, as you can see. Uh, first floor, we have some uh, restaurants and also the ground floor. And they can be open much longer because uh, than the market because they have uh, an outside access. And this is how market hall then looks when they start to all barbecue inside. Well, we won the competition with a big print of uh, strawberries and fruit on the outside, but then the shopping center owner asked us to not do that because they said uh, then people won't go inside. Can you make it neutral from the outside and uh, interesting from the inside and people will go in and take the picture inside and once they're inside they might buy stuff, okay, why not? So we, just, we, we propose to use the street pavement of Rotterdam, which is a grey uh, granite, and just put it all over the facade. And uh, so basically the, um, the market hall is a crease in the city uh, level. And as you can see, uh, it really works. Uh, uh, the building is rather uh, neutral and inside you have this really colorful uh, space. 
This is the, the art piece that an artist uh, from Rotterdam won. It's called Cornucopia, You're in Your Back, and you see all the stuff from the, um, from the market uh, fall down on you. Now, he had like three weeks to make it, and he couldn't find a big computer, so he had to send everything to Hollywood to have it rendered out in, in, uh, in the Pixar studios, the same computer that also made uh, the, the movie for Finding Nemo. And uh, um, while he was doing that and uh, struggling with a lot of uh, uh, problems, uh, the owner of the shopping mall started to become a bit arsy about the stuff that they saw because he had added a lot of stuff that was in there. And they started to discuss with him. And uh, this is him, and he looks a bit rough, but he's actually, he's a really sweet guy. And uh, so they started to have this discussion about, uh, well, you put steaks in there, yeah? You know, in Rotterdam, we have lots of Hindus, and the cow is kind of holy for them, yeah? Can you please not put steaks in? Okay. And uh, you put uh, pork in, yeah? You know, we have many Muslims in the city, and they don't really, think that pork is okay, yeah, so could you get the pork out, okay, no pork, and uh, you, you have chicken in there, yes, what about chicken, well Dutch people think it's bad because it has uh, all kinds of salmonella and stuff like that, so we don't want it, okay, no chicken, what about lamb racks, okay, <laughs> that's, that's it, yeah, and then you have all these insects in there, yeah, yeah, but the insects are in there because they are reference to the painting art of the Dutch, uh, golden century and they actually mean that uh, you can enjoy beautiful uh, things but you should uh, you should always remember that you have to work hard to earn your place in heaven yeah that's very nice but you put bees in and uh, there are people that are really scared of bees because they are allergic no bees no bees okay and the same for wasps no wasps no wasps and so there came this catalog of uh, insects that is acceptable. So butterflies, for example, are fine, and slugs, and uh, I don't know what actually insects, and uh, uh, caterpillars. But uh, he did it all, and uh, he finalized this art piece, and it's a really important piece. Here you see it in all its glory. It's actually perforated, and it, it eats, it absorbs all the, um, the noise in the market and all the black uh, spaces in between you see there are the windows to the apartments. Very important was the, was the big window of Market Hall, it's 40 by 40, and when we won the competition we didn't, we didn't really have solved this idea, so how can you, how can you build this big window? And the, the window is really essential, otherwise you don't see the art piece. So uh, we asked this engineer, um, who happens to be my neighbor, to solve it for us. And he came with this crazy idea to use steel cables for the facade, so that we have hardly any uh, structure. It works a bit like a tennis racket. So uh, you just use the steel cables. In between the steel cables, you put uh, glass uh, on these uh, screws. And in between the glass, you put silicone. So if there's a really heavy storm pounding on the building, the center of this uh, 40 by 40 meter glass facade can be pushed inside the building 70 centimeters, which means that all the glass uh, is uh, still fine and the steel cables are 8 centimeters longer. Now my neighbor became uh, engineer of the year for this facade and he bought himself a new BMW, an electric one because he's a good citizen. And uh, whenever there's a storm, he, he goes to Marktau and he, um, he checks up on it, but he told me that he made a mistake because they, they didn't put all the buildings and the surrounding in there, so um, it will never probably move that far because the, the structure as such is way too sheltered to, to ever give in that, that way. Um, Marktau has a very good uh, uh, environmental uh, label. It's a Briam very good, and we reached that by not uh, air conditioning in this big space. Now you see it's really big space, it's 40 by 40 meters by 120 meters. If you would want to heat this or cool this down, that would cost you a lot of money. So we just decided to not do it and let the fresh air enter underneath the facade and naturally disappear through the roof without any help. Only in summer there's a little bit of uh, mechanical ventilation and in winter we have a bit of uh, uh, heating for the floor so that uh, that it doesn't freeze, but in that basically it's an outside space. And it's also officially an outside space. The city of Rotterdam helped us immensely by declaring it an outside space. So it's not an inside. The interior you see here is officially outside, which means that we don't have a sprinkler. 
um, system, but uh, we have hydrants inside. So if it starts to burn, the fire department goes into the building and does its work inside. I walk, I walk you now uh, to the basement. There is this uh, shopping center and the deliveries. Really important that the deliveries are underground because if you live on the third floor above a market and at four o'clock in the morning all the delivery vans come and they make a lot of noise, then you don't live there for long because you hate it. So we, we said, how can we solve this? So we can basically put it all into the basement, and uh, which freed up a lot of space. Markthal then has uh, shop windows on every side, so there is no backside to Markthal. On the other side of this minus one, there is a shopping center with a supermarket. And the supermarket, uh, of course, they come with big lorries. So we said, OK, we make you a tunnel with uh, hatches in the market, and then you can, uh, you can put the stuff in there. Underneath Marktau is the biggest uh, parking space in Rotterdam. The city paid for it, it was very difficult to build. Uh, 1,200 spaces. And what it does is actually it uh, makes it possible that there are no more cars in the street around the building and um, that everybody who, um, who uses this parking garage uh, might end up in Marktau, which is good for business again. So we built these people this really big uh, inverted pyramid with escalators so to make it easier for them to come in. They also have a different way out, but if they use this nice way to come in, then they end up in the middle of the market and they see a lot of uh, produce around. And this is how you enter. Instantly from the minus four level, you will see the beautiful print above you and uh, it's all the way up there. It's also a museum. So uh, underneath the stairs there are these, uh, these windows and you can see the stuff that they found in the archaeological dig before they, uh, um, before they built the building. Now to the apartments, uh, level 2 to 11 are apartments. We have 102 and for each uh, we have uh, 6 cores. For each core we have uh, 4 apartments. Two of the apartments um, face the market hall on one side. But all four of them have outside spaces and balconies. So this is something that every apartment has, and this is something that uh, half the apartment has. So these beautiful windows to the market. And this is how people live there. And these people live all the way on the top almost, and they live in this inverted uh, attic in a way. If they look out of their window, they, though, they look into the market. And uh, on top then we have penthouse apartments, uh, a bit bigger. You walk up one floor with the stair and you have to go down to the market. This is Nicole, she lives there with her dog. And uh, inside she has this light cord for the bedrooms and on the floor of the light cord you already see a piece of glass. This um, actually makes, uh, um, brings in light into the market a little bit. Those two uh, turned this space into a garden and they are on top of this glass and, um, with the rabbits. This is what you see, so 40 meters below you. For PR reasons, we use the baby to show people that it's not that dangerous. <coughs> and, uh, yeah. This is how market hall works. And then something really interesting happened. It started to become a, a populous place. Um, a, few, a few months before the opening, uh, already on television, people said, please come to Rotterdam because something is happening there. And they predicted that uh, from the 350,000 uh, tourists that visit Rotterdam every year, that we would uh, have 50,000 more because of this building. Well, that's nice. That's a, that's a really big success. We, we built this building for uh, uh, 3.5 million shoppers a year, but mostly Rotterdamers. But we, we didn't really think that it would become uh, also a tourist magnet. And then suddenly this appeared in the Financial Times. Will it be the equivalent of Bilbao's Guggenheim? And that was a bit shocking because we, we built a flat with the market, not uh, a 300 million euro uh, um, extravaganza. Then uh, uh, the really another thing happened. Uh, our queen opened the building. She announced that she would open the building. And the queen never opens uh, apartment buildings or shopping centers. That's way too vulgar for a queen. So basically, uh, she normally opens museums. But she came, she opened the building, she had a lot of fun, and this was the opening act. It's a little bit like a Cinderella with a pumpkin. And then she walked through the market hall with our very happy clients, very proud. Uh, it's always good to have uh, proud clients, and they call you back. Um, but what was really nice, uh, 
in the end, it's what happened outside. While the Queen was inside, the people of Rotterdam were outside. They had to wait 10 years for this building to be done, and now they wanted to get in. And they wouldn't be stopped. And the moment that the doors opened, this happened. All the escalators stopped working, all the doors stopped working. The fire department was in absolute despair, and we had to do some emergency fixes for the first week and then for the, uh, for the weekend, and then for the next week, and then every weekend uh, for the first uh, half year, the fire department came into the uh, building to uh, count people. Now it's a little bit better. Uh, it opened on the 14th of, uh, no, on the 1st of October 2014, but it's, it's quite often extremely busy. It's a really big success. We, we designed it for 3.5 million visitors, but in the first year we had 9 million visitors. It's more than the Eiffel Tower, it's more than anybody ever expected it. Uh, 4.5 uh, million people from Rotterdam, returning customers because the city is not that big, and uh, 4.5 million tourists. And that was really, really special, because Rotterdam never had tourists. Here you see how, how it looks, and uh, what's also really touching is that it actually is a building for also the migrant community. They have embraced the building as much as we hoped for, and so all this um, talk about the art piece actually worked. Muslims feel happy in the building, Hindus feel happy in the building, everybody feels happy in the building. And this is a continuous, uh, I mean, uh, for an architecture office, this is the nicest thing, that you see that your building is used. That it would be such a drama if it wouldn't be used. And it's, it's really used. Uh, architecture critics don't like it that much, but um, the, pop, the people of Rotterdam really do like it. And they, they matter, they really do matter. It's for them. And then you see it really works like a market. This is our um, Prime Minister. Our Prime Minister normally comes to Rotterdam when there's a crisis and the suburbs burn or drug addicts die or something like that. But here he came to the market to show how what a good popular uh, guy he is. Uh, very welcome. We even opened a souvenir shop in Markthol. Before that we never needed souvenirs, but uh, now we have souvenirs in Rotterdam. Or they are even marked on shoes. Um, and our, our developer profiles, they're very, very smart people and they're business people and they knew that this would happen. Uh, architects are a bit naive, they don't know that, but uh, the developers know. And so what they did is they, they bought this um, um, this old building in a, in a shopping street right next to Markt Hall and they renovated it with state money into this uh, beautiful uh, uh, state that it once was. It's a 1950s building very beautiful and now they, it's on a prime uh, spot in the city and all around uh, the building there's so many uh, there's a very happy uh, city manager that continuously tells us how how good the building is doing in its surroundings it's, uh, it's yeah everywhere actually uh, new york times uh, did site and you now suddenly rotterdam is the world's greatest city and the lonely planet says you have to go to rotterdam Lonely planet, oh my god, so we have more and more uh, tourists. Also, this was really shocking. Suddenly, the government ran this advertisement campaign all over the country saying this building was made possible by teachers like you. They wanted to get more pe teachers and uh, tell teachers that teachers are important, and they used Marktal as an example that uh, uh, teachers are actually uh, the real um, designers of this building. Then Jamie Oliver said it's great, which was nice. Um, but again, this is really important that the people like it. And really touching again is that the, um, the Turkish community in, in Rotterdam embraced it so much that suddenly Rotterdam has become the capital of uh, the Turkish wedding. And they take all the, the, the wedding pictures in front of this uh, thing. Which is good because we also have this huge mosque, the, the Alibaba thing, and uh, you know, they, they think that this is more beautiful, which is a, big, uh, a really big um, compliment. And that was it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes? What do the critics say about it? The critics, they think it's a bit vulgar and populist. But if you were, we didn't get uh, any architecture awards for the building, only one from Rotterdam which we were very proud of, but we got a, a Neighborhood Improvement Award, we got a Steel Facade Award, we got a Facade Award, we got a Best Shopping Center Award, we got a Best Parking Garage Award, we got a uh, 
Development Award, or actually three of them, uh, but uh, only one tiny architecture award from, uh, from Rotterdam. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, we're really happy. And, uh, so, can't make everybody happy. Anybody else? Inside the building, yes. yeah. What uh, was really surprising is that, um, well, first of all, 102 uh, rental apartments they were instantly rented out before construction finished. But the, the commercial apartments, the property was not sold. It took the queen to open it and people to enter and see that the the windows to the market don't uh, let noise or smell through. People were a bit skeptic. They were scared, so they, they went inside and then they noticed that it's not a problem, and then they bought it. So it took them three months after opening to sell all the apartments. They all sold now. And what was also surprising is that uh, it wasn't young people like we thought, even though the apartments are not that expensive. But it's uh, a lot of people that returned from suburbia. Uh, they call them the empty nesters, which are people who have. Uh, reach the age of 55 or so, their kids are going to university, suddenly they're out there in the, in the, in the sticks and uh, um, they don't know what to do, it's really boring. So they sell the big house and they come back into the city and marked all they thought was, uh, was a good place. And there's a, there's a thriving community, uh, many people give uh, illegally because there's a fine architecture tours. So uh, some of them actually earn a little bit of money. Yes, that's it. Okay, thanks.